Welcome to the Nerdist Podcast number 844. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Uh, whether you need a landing page or a gallery or a blog or an online store, it's all included with your Squarespace website. Start your free trial today, squarespace.com. Enter the offer code NERDIST to get 10% off your first purchase. And uh, yeah, Squarespace, set your website apart. More about that in a minute. Uh, let's take a stroll over to the Nerdist Community Court Board. First, selfishly, I'd like to promote a couple things. Uh, At Midnight will be back January 3rd. Um, Also, uh, I will be co-hosting live with Kelly again the 4th, 5th, and 6th. So make a quick trip to New York for that. And uh, also The Wall. Um, I I think a lot of people watched it the other night when it was on on NBC. Uh, Really emotional. I I mean, I watched it again. I knew it was going to happen, and I got choked up. Uh, watching it on my computer in my office on the on the NBC feed, but um, we are coming back for a two night premiere, January second and third, and then uh, the wall will be in its regular time slot on uh, eight p.m. on Tuesdays, starting on the third. So second and third January that, and uh, yeah, and then January boy, everything is back up and running. Um, this podcast documentary that some friends of mine made, Graham Elwood, Chris Mancini, of course you probably know from Comedy Film Nerds, uh, they made a podcast documentary called Earbuds. Uh, it is now available for you to buy. This is a great, fun documentary about the world of podcasting. I did some stuff for it. Everyone you know, if you're a podcast fan, did stuff for it. Uh, and it connects fans on, on a really personal level. So go to earbudspodmovie.com to see it now. But they're such great guys, and, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that it finally is out. Also, Diego Aldape uh, writes, My name is Diego. I'm a Mexican Nerdist fan. I did a thing. I developed a show called The Geek Life MX, in which I showcase geek life in Mexico, uh, Monterey, Mexico specifically, and uh, or now I probably should say Mexico. So I apologize, Monterey, Mexico, and all the different subcultures that make up geek culture. Unfortunately, due to a severe lack of budget, my project was canceled a couple years ago, but I recently got a friend to help me uh, edit all the raw footage, and we finally finished it. Fair warning, it's mostly in Spanish. Because Mexico, but uh, doesn't everyone need a little Spanish in their lives? Yes. I uh, plan on adding English subtitles so everyone can enjoy it. The Facebook page is and YouTube channel are both The Geek Life MX. Well done. Muy bien, Diego. And uh, muchas gracias, I would say. I, I really need to learn how to speak better Spanish. Diego, I'm going to follow you and then we're going to come. I'm going to watch the documentary in Spanish and I'm going to learn all. I'm going to learn uh, geek lingo in Espanol. It's time. Uh, this episode is Neil Finn, who is legitimately one of my musical heroes. I've been a Crowded House fan, well, even before Crowded House, uh, Split Ends, then Crowded House, then Neil Finn solo stuff. I've seen him play so many times. Scott Ackerman and I used to go together, and um, Scott was actually the one that tipped me off that he was going to be in town. He's always been on the permanent, if you can ever get Neil Finn, please try to get him to our Booker Deb. And Scott said, hey, Neil's going to be in town. Um, uh, so I, so thank you to Scott Ackerman for that and always follow all of Scott Ackerman's stuff. And thank you to Neil Finn for agreeing to do it. So he, we went to the studio at SIR and we chatted. And, and then I was in this weird position where he was like, I'll play whatever you want. So here I am with like literally one of my musical heroes saying, I'll play whatever you want. It's that sort of weird fever dream that you have sometimes where you go, what if? And it happened. Thankfully, I had made a list, a very uh, comprehensive list, uh, which I'm sure was embarrassing. uh, I'm sure on every level for me to just break out this list and go, here's this one and this one and this one. But I am genuinely such a huge fan. And Neil is such a sweet, sweet, sweet guy. So... We traded emails. He played Largo the next couple of days. So I went to his Largo show and uh, he played a couple songs at uh, SIR, which was great. And then, see, I was trying to avoid asking him to play Don't Dream It's Over, which he said he would totally play, but I just felt bad. I just didn't, you know, it's like I, I feel like a lot of people ask him to play that song. So I really wanted to pick some of my personal favorites that I connected with personally. But then at Largo, he played Don't Dream It's Over with Mitchell Froome, who uh, Mitchell was their producer for, and also played keyboards. He's the one that played the really infamous keyboard stuff on Don't Dream It's Over. And he hadn't played with them for a long time, and he was at Largo and then played it, and the song was just incredible. So I emailed Neil and I said, look, I know you've already done all these great things for me. 
could I convince you to let me use the Largo recording of Don't Dream It's Over? And he said yes. So that's there are three songs at the end. Two of them are Neil in just Neil and a guitar at SIR Studios. And then the last one is the full um, Don't Dream It's Over. It was Neil and his son Liam Finn, who's also fantastic. If you don't know his stuff, you should check it out. And, uh, you know, his band, uh, not Crowded House, but Neil and his band and, Mitch, and Mitchell Froom. So uh, there you go. I'm very excited about this episode. And it was just another one of those, how do I get to do these things? How am I lucky enough to get to talk to these people? That I've idolized my whole life. So there you go. That's the whole that's the whole backstory. Uh, this podcast and that whole backstory, of course, brought to you by Squarespace.com. Maybe I should build a website about my experience. That long story needs some sort of some sort of click through website, a listicle perhaps, of the steps that got us here. Uh, I could do that on Squarespace.com. It's easy. You can create your website and really quickly. It's intuitive. Whether you're an advanced programmer or you don't know anything about anything, uh, it's template-based. Uh, they have amazing 24-7 customer support, and every member of the customer care team is an experienced Squarespace user. So it's not some random person reading off a, a, a screen on the most basic steps. You, you're not going to be a better customer service rep than them, which I feel like happens a lot <laughs> these days. And uh, they'll help you accomplish whatever you want to accomplish for creating your online presence. I mean, social media is fine, but it's all micro, you know? Like, it's so quick bites, you know? Like, make, make something more substantial and uh, use Squarespace. Start your free trial today. Enter the offer code NERDIS to get 10% off your first purchase. Uh, Squarespace, set your website apart. And thanks to, for them for sponsoring this episode, which is Neil Finn, uh, who I think I'm kind of pals with now. Oh, my God. This is a fucking dream. Uh, and I will not dream that it's over. Shit. Yeah. That was, a, that was not cringy. That was good. You know it was good. Because it was natural and it was organic. So you can just shut up about it. All right. There's podcast number 844. Neil Finn. Katie, please roll the thing. Now entering Nerdist.com. just such an epic tale of survival. Should I sit opposite you? Is that a sure, good yeah. idea? Sure, yeah. yeah. We just um, had the pleasure of being able to... Uh, well, we had Mix Fleetwood came and did some drumming on some recent work so in Auckland. So we got some great stories. And he's a very charming man. Was he already... You got him to come to New Zealand? To he do... was in New Zealand um, uh, with Fleetwood Mac and I ran into him and we'd, I'd met him once before and he... He was just enthusing about New Zealand and, and also about, you know, maybe doing something together at some point. I went, well, actually, we're doing a session in February. And uh, why don't you just... He lives in Hawaii, so it's not a huge... Oh, it's not that you know, bad, yeah. It's eight hours. Which, <laughs> yeah, but he's still... For us, it's nothing, you know. Um, <laughs> but, uh, he's, yeah, he was... And he just... It was came at a good time, so he came down and had a two-week, uh, ten-day session. So when, you're, when, when Mick Fleetwood comes into the studio with you, do you say, well, yeah, I guess just do whatever you want, or do you, kind of, do you give him direction, or how does, it, how does it work? Look, he's by far the tallest person in the room, so you give him anything you want. <laughs> anything he wants. And um, he, yeah, no, he, he, he himself admits he's very dyslexic, and so he actually doesn't, I don't know why that affects his, his um, memory, but he will play what he plays. Right. Uh, if you told him to do a particular fill going into the second chorus, there's no way he would get that. Right. Um, he'll once he learns it on his own terms, he can repeat what he did. But no, every and that's what's the beauty of it. He's every take he does is a different um, beast. So we were quite happy to leave him to it, you know. And so you kind of the whole time this is happening, are are you do you if you shut your eyes, you go, yeah, that's Mick Fleetwood. Like, is he is he is he basically doing Mick Fleetwoodisms within the language he of is. the song? He is. He is. You recognize certain fills that you love from Fleetwood Mac records and. Um, and then strange diversions, you know, in the middle of a verse, he'll suddenly go off on some fill, and it's very willful, and, uh, but amazing in someone who's been around for so long, he's, got, he's still got a real sort of childlike approach to making music and, yeah. and enthusiasm, and sits there till the end of the day and listens to, the, you know, the minutiae of the take that just happened and makes suggestions, and, yeah, he's totally enthused and engaged, and he was a joy. Yeah, I've been able to see you perform... A number of times, in a number of different venues, I've seen you. I'm 
pretty sure I've seen a crowded house show, but I've seen Finn Brothers. I saw you play with Johnny Marr oh, and yeah. Wendy and Lisa at yeah, the right. House of Blues. That's right, yeah. And, uh, and it, my impression is that you are just a, a music-generating machine who then just goes on tour and then expresses all of these things, and you go back home and write, and then you go back out on tour. Do you, does it feel that way to you, or do you feel like, ah, I don't really do stuff most of the time? It feels like you're an incredibly prolific well, I'm glad. I'm glad it feels like I'm prolific because sometimes I feel like I'm no, don't, nowhere near get enough stuff out. You know, really? Like, yeah. Well, I mean, you've got to live a life as well. You've got to take stuff in, so you can't just be completely one-dimensional. Occasionally, when I've been in the studio for three months, I do feel like I've lost my ability to relate to the world a little bit. <laughs> um, you've got to get out and have some experience. Um, I'm lucky to have a great family, and they're pretty, um, pretty much all the entertainment I need, and all the sort of you know checks and balances are as a human being, yeah. uh, covered with them, really. Um, I don't get ahead of myself. But I, I'm just in a big hurry to get as much work done as I possibly can, as long as it's good. But I'm also quite slavish about making sure that it's, um, it's you know, well-conceived and well-rendered. And the art is in making it seem easy, but sometimes it's really not, you know. So you've got to... Have, have to, to figure out how to make it seem like it's... You've got to make it sound like it was the easiest thing in the world. But, but the struggle involved in that sometimes is quite epic. I mean, most... You know, and I've heard a lot of people, you know, like really people that you, I assume, would absolutely respect go, oh, Neil Finn is the guy. Like, he's the guy. He writes, because your songs, they always go into a place, it's, you know, it's kind of moving along and then like, oh, how did he think to go there? There's always some twist. There's always some Neil Finn twist where the chords go in an unexpected direction. Do you... Sense, do you automatically feel it that way, or do you have to noodle with stuff until you find something that feels interesting? Well, I've allowed it to remain a mystery. Um, there's no code or manual particularly for me. and I don't know if there is for anybody, but one thing I'm always conscious of is um, making the song move forward and, uh, and keep, you, keep you engaged. And so I suppose for that... I, I mean, I would like to think that my middle eights are um, are always really strong. You know, like I'm, I'm known for my middle eights. <laughs> it's a strange thing to be known for. But I'm always really conscious of that, that place in the song where, yeah, you're going to be taken somewhere that's unexpected, um, a, a beautiful release or or some little t tweaking some nerve that you didn't know you had, you know. But ultimately it is a mystery because you're trying to make people feel something. You have to make yourself feel something first. Uh, there's little moments of revelation after a lot of banal um, experimenting where you suddenly get a little shiver up your spine because some, something's tweaked a nerve for you and you go, well, I'm expecting that this, people will feel that too. So you right. just follow that thread as much as you can. And actually the trick that I've learned, which is the hardest one of all, is to keep going at that time and make as many gains as you can while you're following that thread because the temptation is to go pretty quickly after that with a little nice piece on tape going, oh, that's great. That's going to be a great idea. That's going to be a great song. I'm going to go and have a little cup of tea now as a right. reward or a beer or something. And then you come back and it's not so easy at the, after a little while. So, yeah, you've got to follow that thread at the time. And that is... Get words you, down. You're pretty disciplined. Are you pretty disciplined no, about that? No, I'm hopeless <laughs> at it. Yeah, no, no, I'm always conscious of it, but I just haven't completely captured that, that um, theory and made it into practice yet. But there's so many... Uh, so many crowded house songs are, you know, obviously Don't Dream It's Over is just a part of our cultural fabric. Uh, but there are so many uh, crowded house songs that are very anthematic. You know, I think um, uh, Something So Strong is, an inc is mm. it's just a very celebratory, anthematic. I mean, was that representative of stuff that w you were going through at the time or you were just fresh fresh out of split ends and you know kind of ready to plant your stake in the ground i mean what was what was going on emotionally well i was highly motivated at, at the end of split ends because at the end of any band there's always a tremendous amount of frustration and but the bonds that connect bands are really deep if you're in a band for five or six years the chances are you'll still be arguing about ridiculous things about 20 or 30 years later. Right. And, and a band with your brother. And a band with my brother. That's another relationship that's <laughs> it's really complex, yeah. Um, so, the, you know, the, in, the, in the sort of aftermath of Split Ends breaking up, there'd been all this frustration and things not working very well and, and properly. And, you know, we're still... Actually, we were good friends. We weren't, there wasn't any huge, um, you know, bad feelings. But there was weird unspoken things and... Bands are not honest with each other generally. They kind of circle around each other and 
Um, is that to protect each other's egos or to protect their own egos? Conscious of each other's egos and, right. not, and not upsetting the apple cart. Yeah, and and then the agents start talking, and then yeah, people then are talking that's about... another layer. Yeah, that's yeah. right. But but that does create a sort of energy in the end when you release yourself from that, as I did, and with Paul Hester on board, sure. just the two of us, we talked about. Let's be in a small band. <laughs> it was a six-piece split end, so that was one of the first things we decided. Small band, all fit in one car, and keep the problems <laughs> relatively simple, you know. Um, and we found Nick Seymour, who was a really big burst of energy. And the other thing, I'd been in a band with guys who were six years older than me, my brother's friends, and it was great, and it was a great education for me. And uh, I was always the youngest, always sent down to the shop to buy the sandwiches, you know. That was, um, it was good for me, and I'll keep me humble. Um, but then Paul was the same age as me, and so was Nick. So suddenly I was in a bunch of, in the one car with a bunch of guys my own age, and we were laughing about the same things. And there was a lot of energy from that period. Um, and, you know, we went to L.A. just on a blind mission, really, to see if we could get a deal. We found a deal at Capital, and we found a producer that I'd never, I'd never worked with a real producer like Mitchell Froome was um, that really got involved in songs and songwriting. And he was the one who actually made something so strong into a kind of an upbeat R&B, with an R&B bass line, I mean, loosely R&B, from a pop point of view. But before that, it was kind of a pastoral little folk song <laughs> that I'd written. And uh, actually, on the reissues that are coming out uh, at the end of this year, there's a whole bunch of bonus material, one of which is two demos I made of that particular song, oh, something wow. so strong, showing the sort of uh, you know journey it took from s small little pastoral twee folk song to you know upbeat, rollicking... R&B based pop, and is that is is a lot of that just in being able to trust your producer? Because to me, it seems like one of the most stressful things is you just a song can go in a million different directions, and it can be expressed in a million different ways. So yeah. how do you know, like, okay, this is the one, and I guess we should cut those other parts and make it this new thing that we hadn't intended? Well, in some cases, a glorious accident occurs really quickly. Um, the band will take it and play it in a manner that wasn't expected by me. And that's a great thing about bands is that, you know, uh, they can't play your ideas the way you would play them. So sure. initially you may go, oh, I didn't mean it to be, and then you go, oh, actually, that's maybe, maybe that's a little better. I think that opens little cracks in the armour of a song and allows light in somehow. I'm um, not sure if that makes sense. But when you work on your own entirely, which sometimes I do and other people have made, uh, you can make some great work, but it, it has a kind of a sealed feeling about it like it's an impenetrable mm -hmm. thing um you know you're playing you're playing every instrument you're you're it's so it's it's like yeah i don't know it's like beauty you can't kind of reach into and grab hold of i think a band when a band plays something the mixture of personalities means that you've got some texture and you've got some depth right that you didn't even imagine yourself so you know i'm a great fan of collaboration bands you know um people who aren't necessarily experts either i think people who are struggling at the edge of their abilities play better than people for whom it's too easy right yeah but, well you're also hungrier when you're because you're trying to you're trying to elevate yeah and so how do you you know like when you've been playing music and you feel it and you've you've achieved so much how do you keep that hunger fresh and how do you keep that that drive you know when you could i would imagine like ah you know i'm I'm good for money. I have a family. I could just not do anything for for a long. Like, how do you how do you find the drive to to go through it all again? Well, it's just compulsive, really, because when you you hit those moments of transcendence with music, it's like a you know one of the best feelings in the world, and um, that's compulsive. And there's also, I as time goes on, I sort of feel like, in our own humble way, musicians have got a really important role to play out there, and so. It, 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 you know, it's juggling that feeling that this is the most important thing in the world, with a with a all the time being completely aware of its cosmic insignificance. You know, like there's <laughs> something between those two points of view that's you, you've got to remain. You know, like because none of it matters at all, really, in, in terms of life and death and the cosmos and all that. But music is the mo one of the most positive things that we've got on the planet, and God knows there's so much that's completely messed up and you know, jarring, jarring, nerve-jangling things happening in the world. Music is, is even more important now, I think. And there's great music around still somehow in the midst of all this crazy unreality and <laughs> distraction. People are making great music, so it makes me believe in human beings, you know, to hear it. Was it, uh, did it, did the amount of success off the first album feel oppressive in any way? Like, oh my God, how are we going to do that again? You know, like, what is the, I mean, because it really was... Mm. I know. I know. The first album was 1986, right? And so yeah. for a couple of years, 
you know, when the music business was much different and an album could really breathe for like a year or two. Like I remember MTV, you know, it was, real yeah, it was slowly, really different. Yeah. Slowly rolled out every song. Oh, the crowd house song, it's great, you know. And now it just feels like everything just burns really fast. But at the time, I mean, you know, when that first album came out, it was it was everywhere, and it was yeah, so we, so much a part of all of pop culture. And you know, did you feel the weight of that? And did it did it feel like any more pressure? Were you just excited to go back in and do it again? Well, it's a you know anyone who's had a moment of success like that um, in whatever field of the entertainment industry has to go through that. That, because there's a composite range of skills that it takes to become success, to be successful, I think, over a long period of time especially. And it kind of helps if you're interested in the idea of being successful and being a celebrity mm -hmm. and, you do it, and you're prepared to do it well and you don't resent the uh, intrusion and the, the attention that you get. But that is an adjustment, there's no doubt. We're excited to be, to be having, uh, you know, to be part of the zeitgeist or part of the moment, you know, you hear your song coming from a window of a car that's pulling up next to you at the lights. It's a great feeling. It really is. But, um, and, you know, and, and shows are celebratory and, you know, there's a feeling of this is a really excite, exciting moment in our lives. There's, it comes with a, another range of emotions. One, I was feeling a little guilty that my new band was having all the success <laughs> with my old band, you know, for my brother and for sure. my, the, my old bandmates. I kind of couldn't enjoy it as much as I... Should have, and also Catholic the, guilt. Catholic guilt. <laughs> That's exactly what that is. And it, exactly guilt. what it is. Yeah. Um, are you a Catholic? <laughs> I, I was raised Catholic. Oh, in the Catholic understand. school. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I and yeah. I know you're you were raised. Pretty well, I Catholic. was raised yeah. Catholic. Yeah. I'm, I'm seriously lapsed at this point. But, <laughs> Me um, too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I feel like most people that I talk to that are raised Catholic, like if they went to Catholic school, like, oh yeah, yeah, I lapsed a long time ago. But I think it's there's something in that educate. Well, that sort of upbringing that makes you i don't know i think there's some good stuff goes on there absolutely some good neurosis uh, you know a little <laughs> bit of good uh the guilt is not even a bad thing there's some good subject material for songs there and sure imagery's great you know <laughs> i don't i don't uh, feel bitter about it that's it. <laughs> that's good i wasn't a, a badly abused anywhere or you know like thankfully but i feel like the and, but i also feel like um the, at least the people that I know that are from New Zealand you know the Concords or Reese Darby or Taika mm -hmm. Waititi like all these they're such the, the, the mood seems to be and I don't know if they're representative of all uh, New Zealanders but very laid back and kind of like well you know just kind of take it as it comes and this is, seems you know and not super stressy no well it's sort of laid back and, and relaxed and deadpan in a, in a way that <laughs> plays well I think in America where things are generally people have the impression that you need to be more outgoing pumped up right. to get successful to get noticed you know in New Zealand you don't grow up thinking you're going to be noticed anyway because it's so far away from everywhere but there is a sort of underlying anxiety and sort of uh, insecurity underneath and all those guys might testify to that as well they're breaking out yeah definitely but um, I think one one thing that I grew up in an unusual situation because my brother was in the strangest band that's ever been uh, in the way they looked um, and before I joined Split Ends they really were an extraordinarily strange band you know like the music was really weird the, the image was incredibly weird so I grew up in this arch conservative country with this role model of guy with a mohawk you know this was 1976 <laughs> my mother would have to explain to her friends when he'd come around and you know it was one of those so I probably had a really nice um, and we were looking at the world through rose-coloured spectacles. You know, you, you have romantic ideas of what Hollywood's like or what, you know, the marquee club in London was like. And I think that serves you quite well because you always walk into a big city in a slightly wide-eyed... Um, but also, you know, and, and I think those guys you talk to, there's a little bit of not that impressed with the things that are the shallow aspects of the culture. But right. really, really interested in the deep... Um, the things that have gone on in places like America with the music and the culture and the films and the comedy, really deep connection with that stuff. But that seems like another layer underneath everyday life yeah. when, when you get here. And so, they, you know, they, you just sort of walk around a bit wide-eyed and well, even, even deadpan. With, even with the Concords, I just remember, it, it, like, they, I always thought, I know I've t said this on the podcast before, yeah. but, you know, like, the day they found out their show was picked up for HBO, they got a call... Like, hey, your show's picked up, and Jermaine was like, "Oh, that's great. We're eating." <laughs> like, he just didn't, they just wanted to finish, just wanted to finish their lunch, and it's like anyone else I know would be like, "What?" Yeah, you know. So it's and well, I, and I respect that, and I feel like it's probably way healthier to be that way. Well, they're really fine and well, well balanced people, and I, you know, know them a little bit too, and they're really wonderful company, and yeah, I think they they deserve their success. Apart from the talent, um, yeah. you don't begrudge them a thing, you know, like they're not putting themselves out there like 
the you know, be all and end all, like young gods. Um, <laughs> is there a even though they are, is there, is they are gods. Is there like a Kiwi Brotherhood where it's like if anyone kind of blows up outside of the out of your own community, it's like oh, we all kind of. You know, like uh, we... this is a lot of jealousy, and you know, <laughs> tall poppy syndrome is alive and tall well puppy, in New yeah. Zealand. Yeah, completely. Um, but I think the good friends that you have stay with you. You know, no matter what. Um, well, the great thing about when they blew up here is that suddenly it was uh, being a New Zealander and standing in the middle of a group of people and really not saying hardly anything, just going yeah, was suddenly quite credible. You know, like yeah. it was a good way to behave, and people thought that was hilarious because <laughs> you had the right accent. You know, you were a little bit like Murray, being a little bit like Jermaine. Right. Not, not having to really work that hard. It's, it really did us all a favor. It made, you know, New Zealand Reserve seem like a, a thing. Well, you, you know, I actually, it's, it's, I don't ever comment on other people's Facebook pages, but uh, someone sent me your performance of Don't Dream It's Over from Australian 60 Minutes. Oh, yeah. And the first comment was this woman, whom she was very enthusiastic. Oh, I love this band. They're they're my favorite Australian band. I want to be like, <laughs> they're not Australian. Like I almost got really mad on your behalf. Well, people get more mad than we do. You know, like, I don't really care. You know, well, like... I know, but I just assume like you know you it's be, I, there's just this just seems like kind of a it's like a willful ignorance. They're like, well, you don't even you don't know that they're Australian. They're just you know like is is there a is there a competitive identity between New Zealand and Australia that you're aware of? There's some fun to be had with it. You know, um, to harken back to the Concords, one of my favourite episodes they did was where they went and stood outside the Australian Embassy in, in New York and <laughs> pulled, give the fingers to the guard outside. And, actually, they had a, a Reese, um, um, uh Darby. No, no, no. Uh, oh, God, no, his name slipped my mind. Um, Master of None, what's his name? Oh, Aziz Ansari. Aziz Ansari, yeah, sorry. Um yeah, they had him on this. It was just that episode he was on. And right. It was about racism, but it was about racism between New Zealanders and Australians, <laughs> which was quite... And I'd never seen that done before. No, New, well, New Zealanders are really bugged by the fact that Australia claims credit for a lot of New Zealand things. Sure. Um, Sam Neill, you know... Um, actually, they're not so bothered about Russell Crowe. They're OK about, about <laughs> being taken by the Aussies. But um, Crowded House, you know... I, it's a difficult thing to navigate for me because I feel... I'm a New Zealander. I live in Auckland, and I feel, you know, that... I've never really had anything else to say about where I'm from, but we started in Melbourne, so I've got a great affinity for Australia, and the band was treated, you know, we've got a really good thing in Australia, and I kind of flattered that they consider that I'm, you know, honorary Australian. I think that's it's like being adopted by another family, you know, by your, <laughs> sure. your wife's family or something. So um, I try to stay out of that particular debate. It does get, you know, Australians a little bit like they're a little bit, like we don't think about that too much because that's New Zealand. That's right. Like, Little guys, you know, we don't have to think about that. Right. Which irks the New Zealanders. They <laughs> sometimes spend too much time thinking about it. I'm desperate to go to New Zealand. That's, we just, we... It's just across the water. I know. Well, yeah. we just, my, my, I just got married and we went to Japan for our honeymoon and we're like, and we thought, oh, well, you know, Japan wasn't a terrible, terribly long flight. We survived yeah. it fine. New Zealand's not that much farther. It's, it's a long, but it's overnight. That's the good thing. The yeah. fl they organize the flights well for their overnight, so you can sort of sleep. It's 12 hours. So it's a big flight, but it's, um... Yeah, but I, I just feels to me like getting in a car and driving to the shop now. Like it really is so normal to get on that flight. Is uh, is December a good time to go? We were thinking about going over Tremendous. the holidays. Yeah, it's All a great right. time. Um, well, I mean, early summer sometimes there's it's unpredictable weather wise, but it's warm and yeah, it's beautiful. Any time's good. The most stable time of year. But then you live in California, so you want weather. Right. You want to go away and get some weather, right? You don't sure. want to. Well, you know, we find days every day. I'll That's, tell you what, I mean, though, we get real. We get real sensitive real quick. So it's like, you know, we're so spoiled here with our weather and we yeah. go other places and like, hey, you know, let's go see, let's go see winter. And then yeah. it'll snow for a second. You're like, fuck, I got it. Yeah, I now, got it. It's sludge now. <laughs> yeah. It's gray. <laughs> yeah. What is this gray? How do you survive this gray? Like you get, true. you get spoiled here very, 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 very quickly. Well, we're enjoying it. We've been here for the last three weeks, my wife and I, and um, hanging out. My, our son lives in Silver Lake. Um, Which, with Liam? His wife. Yeah. I loved his album too, by oh. the way. Thank you. I loved it too. And yeah. I'll pass that on. Um, yeah, he's, they've just had a baby, actually. Um, we're pretty excited about that. Oh, your that. grandparents. So, yeah, I am, yeah. Um, That's nice. Uh, which is an, an incredible joy, I must say. It gets a good rap from people, and they always say, with an, you know, look in their eyes like, you get all the pleasure and you get to sleep well as well. <laughs> you don't have all the responsibility. And it's true. It's true, yeah. So um, we're enjoying that at the moment. And we haven't had one. Oh, there was a bit of rain two days ago. It rained for about ten, like five, a second. five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah a second. Um, big drops. 
big drops. But everyone ran inside like it like the like sky 10 seconds was between them falling out of space, yeah. and then and then it was everything was fine, and then we were breathed a sigh of relief again. I never forget. The first time I was in L.A. and it, there was a rain. It rained for probably an hour, I think. <laughs> and we were watching TV and they, they crossed to the helicopter and they were storm chasing on the helicopter. <laughs> they were actually filming rain, <laughs> drops of rain I know. from a helicopter. If it rains for more than a couple of days in a row, they'll send some intern, like some low-level reporter who's trying to you know get their wings on the reporting yeah. staff like they'll send them out to malibu and put them in like a poncho and they'll just stand there in the rain and go yeah. i know the surf's crazy yeah the people are trying to you know these pothole you know la was just not designed for rain so the roads get real bad real fast and people just don't know how to handle it well, i mean you know when dust gets wet and after weeks of sitting on there it's gonna get slippery yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but still i mean i still feel like we are incredibly spoiled here well, it is, and it's wonderful, really. It's an amazing environment. We used to find L.A. very mysterious back in the day because we would always be in a hotel on Sunset um, Boulevard and really can't walk anywhere that feels like any kind of community or whatever. But as soon sure. as we got to know people and we went to people's houses and then even more so now with our you know, son living in Silver Lake and that being real, there's a real community sense Absolutely. there. And, you know, you go to, I think people are on it. They must be on some kind of really good medication because <laughs> you go to the supermarket, the people are so happy with work in the supermarket. I mean... Oh, yeah, that's medication. What, is it? Do you I'm think? Sure that's medication. Yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> they say, have you had a good day shopping, sir? That's go, so what? nice. I just it's feel like... quite good, yeah, and it's I, even... I feel like the median emotion in L.A. is, ah, I hope no one laughs in my face and tells me I'm a piece of shit, I'm just trying to do... You know, I feel like everyone's just scared and well, trying yeah, to... Well, yeah, I don't know. We they, People seem extraordinarily friendly at the oh, moment. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. It might be that that neighborhood is a very tolerant, wonderful community neighbor it is it's nice silver lake yeah. you know silver lake's one of those neighborhoods that bounced back and became you know it was like a, an art community kind mm. of sprung out of it it used to you know the neighborhood kind of ran down and then yeah it, well you know then they start putting in their uh, artisan coffee shops and then like artists start moving in and then yeah. you know they kind of form their own little community so the la is really a collection of though it's a collection of yeah and within those there are communities see that's the thing you don't hook into straight away and it seems so vast and just ringed by uh, by freeways and you know like quite intimidating. It took me a long time, but the other thing that have, that made me connect to the place was finding Lago because oh um, yeah, that became a little home away from home. Every time I came in, I'd hang, can't go down and hang out and do get up with John Bryan or oh, yeah. do a show with me and myself and you know both the old place Fairfax and the new new place. I mean, I, mean, I love. I mean, I've. Um, I used to. I mean, I've been doing comedy at Largo since 1997. Yeah. So I. I love the new space, and I love that the I love that Flanny put this made the little tiny room as a yeah. homage to the old Largo. Yeah. But I really do. There was something about the old Largo that was just unexpected, and it's like, what is this kind of weird hole in the wall? And then you go in, and it's basically this kind of nice pub. I had some with brilliant, the most amazing, brilliant nights there. Yeah, incredible. Um, and it's so dark; you don't even know who's there. Right. Which is great, and all of a sudden you're there one night, and like John's up there, and he's starting to build some w weird loop thing, and you don't even don't know what it is at first, and then you realise it's all the young dudes, and Ian Hunter's sitting next yeah. to you. <laughs> you go, oh, wow. And you can see Ian Hunter's go, his yeah. mouth's open, and he's going, what? Yeah, because that room only you know? held held like maybe 150 people yeah, or 200 most, people. Yeah. There was no backstage. You got to the stage from basically Walk the front the kitchen. door or through yeah. the kitchen. You go through the back that way. It was a great community came out of there, like. Um, Elliot Smith, you know, you'd see him there quite often, and yeah, um, yeah, you know, just really, really great bunch of people. Amy Mann, up. Colin Hay, Amy, like yeah. it was just, it was a really nice special. And, Van Montanche is a regular there and stuff. It was a really good little community, and it made LA feel really friendly for me. All of a sudden, you know, somewhere to go. Is it, is that is it refreshing for you to find places like that? To balance out, you know, when you have to do like a real presentational show like in a you know in a huge theater or an arena or something is it does it kind of feel nice like you know performing for like 150 200 people it just it kind of grounds me does that does it feel that way i love that environment i end up doing shows at lago almost every time i'm in la just and in fact it must be a bit galling for people i've got people who will fly from seattle to come down to the lago shows and they must by now be going well, I mean, if you came to Seattle, I wouldn't have to do this. But <laughs> actually, we did. We did come there. There's a lot of places we don't get to, unfortunately. I, I feel a little bit like I've removed myself from some of the areas. Not deliberately. It's just that they turn up on tour schedules and you go, well, it'd be nice to get to Texas this time even. Or, and, right. you know, and they just end up, the timings don't get work or whatever. But 
it is a regular place for me to try out new songs, um, as it is for comedians to try out new material. Yes, yes. Um, it's a really familiar environment. We're, we're doing a couple coming up soon again, and there's a nice unpredictability about it, and people will forgive any amount of looseness. Uh, I can decide to do a song that I don't even really remember, and people won't hold it against me. Um, right. I love that sort of state of performance anyway where you're on the edge of your seat, you know. Um, it's always been, it was the way that we used to perform with Crowded House. It's the way that I like performing. Uh, too much formality is a vibe killer for me. So, yeah, Lago has it in spades. So how do you know, how do you sort of feel like, you, you must have songs that you want to do, but you know that there are songs that the crowd wants to hear. Mm. So how do you, every time you tour decide what the playlist is going to be like okay you know i i i saw you know i saw beck at the orpheum a couple of years ago and he said at the top of the show all right i'm going to do like seven new songs and then i'll play all the stuff that I, that you want that i know you guys are already know mm. and it was a really interesting way to do it because everyone was very engaged in the first seven songs and then it's like okay and then he did you know devil's it's, haircut it's a quite yeah it's a good little um it's a Real pro move that. <laughs> Beck would know he knows some good pro moves at this point. I haven't quite tried that that one, but it is quite good. I think Radiohead are just doing exactly the same thing at the moment. They're playing six of the new songs on their record right, right up front. It is quite good. I think people understand the premise, so they'll stay with you, and then knowing that they're not going to get shafted later on, you know. Right. Does it? Can I mean? I've always wanted to know how it feels to play. You know, when you have a song like Don't Dream It's Over and you know that everyone knows it and you've played it for 30 years, do you still feel the same joy or do you feel like, oh, I guess I better do this? Or does it, how do you keep that fresh and new? And I really enjoy playing Don't Dream It's Over. I, I always have. And thankfully all the songs that, I mean, there's a couple of things maybe that you get a bit tired of on a, a course of a tour that don't wear as well. I won't say what they are, but um, <laughs> Don't Dream Myself is not one of those. I really enjoy singing it and playing it, and uh, I don't think I'll ever get sick of it. I'm relieved that the, the songs I became known for um, as a young man are not impossible to sing or, or do the moves for. You know, like, I think if you're known for it, I guess if you're a punk rocker or something, and it gets tough when you get to 60. You oh, know? Yeah, like you've yeah. got to maintain that energy. I mean, Iggy Pop does it magnificently, but there's probably quite a few who can't manage it. So, um, yeah, I'm glad. You know, my songs are, they're, by and large, I'm happy to sing ballads. I love slow, sad songs. I always did. Lullaby Requiem is one of my favorite songs. Oh, thank of you. Of all time, one Great. of my favorite songs. Well, it was written, you know, shortly after my mother passed away, so it was a deeply felt one. So, yeah. Do you find more uh, more inspiration to write and express stuff, sad things or happy things, or is it just sort of a balance of both? Uh, you know, it's... It, in some ways, for me, anyway, it's easier to d dip into melancholia as a as a starting point for a song because it's a kind of feeling that I enjoy from music myself. Um, always did, even when I was a pretty carefree fourteen year old and I didn't have a care in the world. I just loved the sad, you know, slow sad songs. But then you get into the habit in a band of thinking, well, we're going to need some up songs, so we better make sure a few of them are up tempo. And sure, uh, and I probably still have that lurking in there a little bit. But um, I don't know if you ask people that really like my music, I think. There's a good chance that most of them would be relating. Would but their favourite songs might be the medium to low to slow songs. Uh, you sure. know, and I there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. When you went into the studio, like so, Crowded House really was like it was like ten years, right? Eighty six to ninety six, the 10, initial yeah. run. Yeah. Before you guys came back in two thousand five. Yeah. And then, uh, what was that? You know, how did that journey start to feel? Like, Temple of Low Men, by the way, was my senior year of high school. Hmm. But K, K Rock was in full swing back then and that cassette tape was just in my car for right. almost that entire that entire year great well so, yeah that one didn't get as much attention as the first one in the end but it was yeah it's one of my favorites and what do you think contributed to that was it the was it sort of the end of a decade and the music business shifting or was it what do you think it was well it's I don't know for sure I think maybe the second album is always a difficult um, one to to pull off you don't have as much time I think the songs were a little darker when uh, it's ironically it was an easy album to make we made it very easily we enjoyed making it it wasn't a struggle in fact the first album was more of a struggle it sounds more like a fun record um, I guess it yeah but and also maybe don't, Better Be Home Soon was the single we put out from it and we all thought that was going to go 
all the way, but it sort of stalled, and then the capital ran out of ideas. I think so. <laughs> that's a far more detailed, businessy kind of answer than I than I should have given you. No, really. that was a good answer. I don't know, man. It's just a record, you know. No, I we don't know. Who knows? <laughs> well, it's interesting here because yes, Temple of Low Men was a tonally darker record, but I thought Woodface was more seemed to be more upbeat. You know, you had we came at yeah. Pineapple Head seemed like a, a a more upbeat song. I don't know if it, yeah, Weather with You was a real upbeat song, and yeah. you know, it was a real bright, breezy song. She goes on, yeah, lovely, beautiful. Thank song. you. Yeah. So what, I mean, at that point, did you make the conscious decision or was it just emotionally like that's where you were at by the time Woodface came out in 91? The songs just come out the way they come out. And, you know, there's a little bit of afterthought you can put into the construction of the album and where to put, what to put first and all that in order to create an impression. But really the songs, yeah, you're just thankful for each one that comes and has a feeling attached to it. And in some cases they're upbeat. The ones that Woodface... Uh, some of the ones that were the more upbeat songs on Woodface came as a result of Tim and I, my brother, writing songs together for the first time. And they weren't even meant for the album at first, but our solution to having two bodies of songs and two albums potentially in the go and neither of them finished or constructed was just to combine the whole thing, you know, the simple solution. Oh, Tim, do you just join the band and then we'll do all the songs <laughs> together and you'll be in Crowded House. Sounds simple, right? <laughs> Um, but you know, people that people are complicated. You know, like people relationships are complicated. Well, it, it mostly just didn't fit quite as well on stage because he is, we have different ways of approaching it. Inhibited our we had a three piece thing going on. You know, like where we were able to really make our shows pretty loose and wild, and we could the banter was really understood. And Paul would always you know be there with a punchline if I left something hanging. And um, but having another strong presence on stage just meant we were kind of going. Oh, oh no! Sorry, you'd be talking on top of each other all of right. a sudden, and uh, that sounds like a strange way to 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 describe a problem. But it is, but inherently became just a little bit of a problem. So, and he felt it as well. He didn't feel like he was fully engaged, and yeah. But the album benefited from those songs, and you know, we make music. We have done since, and we do it with a great deal of joy still. And we're kind of better when we come back to it from time to time, rather than doing it all the time. Sure. Yeah. When you do, do you, when you look back at the albums now, does it? Is it sort of a diary of your life at the time? Do you look back and go, oh, I guess I really was going through this and I didn't realize it at the time, but that's what this album was saying. Do they, do they all kind of say something special to you? There is, there's things in the, each song that are true, but there's also um, fantasy. Well, you know, there's imaginings. There's um, just a little bit of kind of skullduggery. I don't know if that's a term <laughs> that people are familiar with here, but... Um, yeah, just to get a song to feel like it's a there's a person. I always like to disengage from the song at some point and go, well, there may be some truth from my life in this, but I I want to imagine I'm a character singing the song. I don't want to be feeling like I'm you know exposing my innermost thoughts sure. all the time. But then if you can get a, a, a if you can get the people to believe that I'm exposing my innermost thoughts, then that's a real success. So there's sort of a dichotomy. And I don't want people to read them as diaries, but I'm also quite flattered when they do because it means that they've actually connected and listened. And they, sure. Yeah, so I haven't figured that one out quite yet. Well, there's a little bit of a Rorschach thing going on. I mean, like, you know, people will... At I'm sure people tell you, mm. oh, your song means this, and you go, oh, okay, I guess if, if it means that for you, I suppose it does. Yeah, it's very true, and um, I wouldn't want to interrupt that process for anybody. I like leaving a series of doors open, um, and people can wander into whichever one they want. You know, sure. And, uh, so my lyrics are a little bit open-ended, elliptical or whatever is the current um, journalistic expression for that kind of <laughs> lyric writing. Uh, I'm not alone there. I have a certain um, ad I have great admiration for people like uh, Randy Newman or who can tell us a, an amazing story in a very lucid and coherent way. I, actually, I was talking to Mitchell Froome yesterday who's been working with Randy and I was, as we all do, we look to the you know, the guy in the next paddock and go, wow, I wish I could do that. And it sounds so effortless. <laughs> and he says, oh, Randy, he really works hard. He, he, he's, you know, he just, he, as far as Randy's concerned, music's really hard. Yeah. And it's a matter of how much work you can put into getting things the right the way. And he'd be changing lines right to the very end. Uh, so I take great comfort from that. It's not that I ever would expect to be able to reach a point where he, that he does, but I'm also tweaking and uh, working on things till the very end of the process, um, there was a chance of transformation, you know. Sure. And I'm happy to abandon ideas and actually destroy things, throw them up in the air and wreck, you know. It's something I've spent a week on. It's actually quite a joyous feeling to throw it out in a really unceremonious way um, and just keep one little aspect of it that you, you know is the right 
part, you know. Yeah. Well, and also once you, you know, you do the album and then you tour and then you've played the song hundreds of times, do you ever think, oh, I kind of, it kind of evolved this way. Boy, I wish I could go back and kind of redo that one now, now that I've done it this many times. Sometimes that happens on stage, you really hit some heights, yeah. And in fact, it almost always happens because you'll have a night that's like a, just a transcendent night with an audience in front of you and you'll play... Every song, you feel like every beat or every chorded beat is you can control and, and use to your advantage. You know, you've just got that much. It's like a microscopic detail. As much you're not actually having to con be conscious of it, but you can sense that you're hearing music in a very microscopic way. And, yeah, and you find little revelations about songs that you weren't aware of when you recorded them. So, but you know, that's sometimes the recorded version will always have a certain magic that you can't recreate as well so you know it goes both ways is there a is there a specific <laughs> is there a specific guide to a band breaking up is there a moment of we're not doing this anymore or you kind of just stop calling each other or agents community like how does when someone crowded house breaks up in 1996 how does that manifest? Is it just a eh, maybe we shouldn't do this anymore or was it did they everyone uh, kind of feel it was coming uh, every band's probably different. Bands are like the reason that they break up mostly, and that's rare beast that continues on for a long time, is because you really, as you become an older, it, it suits a young, um, a, a young man or a young woman's uh, life to when you're not really attached or you're reasonably free, and you know, no, you don't have kids. And yeah. I had kids early, so it was a little different for me. But um, uh, as soon as you become an adult, you know, like in your thirties or whatever, the amount of compromise and um, allowance that you need to make for people's personalities and egos and um, sensitivities becomes overwhelming for some people. Um, I don't know that that's exactly the reason it happened. It, Paul Hester left Crowded House in Atlanta. Funnily enough, there's a little strange echo of split ends before I joined. Um, the, one of the original members was called Phil Judd, and he was one of the writers, and a key part of the early band. He left in Atlanta as well. Huh. So there's something about that town. Was it like in the middle of a tour? Or no, that was Prince's last show, right? Was it? Was it was the last show in Atlanta? I think it was the last show in Atlanta. But anyway, there's something about that town. There's that something about a, Atlanta that's like, we're done. It, it, you know, and it's not a, a negative thing necessarily. It was for us, but uh, we had amazing shows in Atlanta, <laughs> I hasten to add, and have done since. Um, but yeah, there's a... Uh, Even the area code of Atlanta is 404, which is the error you get when a website does not have a file that you're looking for. Oh, so it's just, it's going, it's going too deep. It's going too deep. There's some it. type of energy under yeah. Atlanta. But it, so he, he left in the middle of a tour, you said? Or just yeah, like he did. And he had, uh, well, he had lost a little bit of um, heart for the whole thing. And he'd become not, you know, because he's one of the funniest guys I've ever known and a great friend. And when he was on, as he mostly was, uh, he was capable of transforming a room with laughter and, you know, and a great drummer and all that, everything you'd want from somebody in your band. But he just lost a bit of heart for it, and by the time we got to Atlanta, he was actually deeply affected by Kurt Cobain dying. It happened about a week before he left. Um, and I just think it came at a certain time where it was really depressing. He found it really uh, really depressing, and he was not being... In, he was about to have a baby. There was all these things that had combined for him. And he left, and we kept going out of stubbornness, and because we we just didn't want to let that, you know. And 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 we did some great shows, and we went and tried to make some new songs. But there was something about had upset the chemistry, and I thought, well, if this is a different beast now, I didn't feel like. And I had the same feeling when Split Ends broke up. I said, I've got there's a lot of baggage now to continue on. I'd like to have a fresh slate and be able to work with people still. Uh, collaboration, as I said, is a really key thing for me, but. I didn't want to be limited by being in a band. Um, sure, I am envious of bands that can stay on with their original lineups. It's, it's, you know, I, I have a great affection for that whole concept. I mean, I guess it's just, I guess the grass is always greener on both sides. You know, you stay with one band and then you can mm. grow in new ways. But then when you don't, then you know, you have all sorts of new chemistries to discover with new collaborations. Yeah. And that's right. And that doesn't always mean that you get. That it's sometimes more confusing for people because they don't know what you know where, you, where to place you anymore a band has a nice convenient thing umbrella to put people's feelings memories attachments periods of time under this band name you know like yeah uh it's a mysterious thing i have people that will say to me i only like 
you when you do crowded house things. <laughs> no, no, I, do. Someone I, I mean, they don't say it quite as blatantly as that, but they basically say that. You know, for the internet, I'm sure it's people do talk that blatantly. Like, well, sometimes they do. Do yeah. more of this. Occasionally, I bristle a little bit and I send, I shoot back a kind of a barb. Oh, you and do? Then, and they get really kind of upset about it and, and go, oh, I didn't realize you were such a, and I thought you were a good guy, but you know, no. <laughs> and I say, look, I tell you what, send, if you've bought records that you're not enjoying because they're not cool crowded, send them to me, I'll give you a refund. Yeah. And I so far have no one sent one. <laughs> I would say uh, the same thing too. Like, hey, fine, you're not happy. Let me just make this right for you. Yeah. You know, and then you won't be able yeah, to then be upset stop bugging anymore. me. Yeah, 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 exactly. Well, I think one of the things that I always, because, you know, so much of my young life was devoted to comedy and, and every comedy, everything I could get my hands mm. on. And I could tell very quickly that you guys were funny guys. I could tell that you guys, you know, and particularly like you said, Paul, he always mm. kind of had that that sort of like smirk and the gleam like okay yeah these are these guys have some sort of comedic appreciation well we we found that one of the ways of coping with um you know fairly sometimes fairly mindless sort of activity that you you have to embark on as a band you know photo sessions and um interviews and tv and stuff our way of coping with that was by subverting and that as much as we possibly could and even on stage you know like we always loved it when things went wrong and we had an ability to, to, to the banter between us was unforced and made every show distinct from the last. You know, they'd be able to remember. Somebody would say, oh, I was there the night that you examined one of the um, people in the front row, um, <laughs> <laughs> examined their, their handbag and, and did a commentary on that. And, you know, I remember that, you know. So you remember the nights and their little points of um, memory and... And people know if they're going to come to see you, they're not going to get remotely the same show that they saw last time. I think right. that's important for me anyway. Well, I think it's also why, uh, which you may or may not want to hear about this, but, you know, why the sort of the crowded house bootleg was such a thing, you know, among crowded house fans. We were like, oh, my God, I got this one show. You know, I mean, I would trade shows with, like, oh, I got this one from oh, 1989. Great. Oh, I got this one from here. And then you would hear the distinct differences in the way the songs were presented. It was just like everything was just a little bit, yeah, no, no two shows ever really sounded alike. Yeah, I, we had a somebody at the fan club put out a, a, a record of just banter. Um, I can't remember what it was called. It might have been called "I Like to Watch" or something. I, I don't remember now, but it was um, it was quite entertaining. I mean, I wouldn't listen. To, I haven't listened to it for a long time, but yeah, when Paul was on fire, he was really unstoppable, you know. And um, I, I still like another reason, probably like Largo. It has a lot of humour. There's a lot of yeah. humour possible with there, and yeah, you know, we're still fishing for those those moments, drawing it, the audience in a little bit. Yeah, and like a good heckler. Yeah, oh, you do like the heckler. Oh, I don't mind it. Well, I mean, you know, as you would know well, I'm sure there's good hecklers and there's bad hecklers. Yes. You know, there's yes. people who feed you lines. Yes. And can and you can rib, you know, and and take the piss out of, and they take it well. And there's people who just want to uh, unseat, unnerve you, or they're just drunk. I oh my god, or they're just drunk. Yeah. You just reminded me. I was when, both. When I when I was at the House of Blues show, there was a guy. Who would not stop screaming Johnny Marr's name? Oh yeah. Who it just when Johnny, it's just in the middle for so no reason. Annoying. Johnny Marr. So annoying. He like, said it like legitimately, and he and he seemed like the kind of guy like ah, maybe I shouldn't tell him to stop. He kind of seemed like a drunken. You can it can go horribly wrong when you focus on those people, um, the wrong person because they take it as a you know embod em it emboldens them. Right. And they become more and more unpleasant. And the, most of the audience are not that focused in on it so you already right. lose an audience quite easily i'm sure it's the same in your but in field, a venue but... the size of the house of blues when it was you know on, mm. on sunset it was like it was it's not like a it wasn't a giant venue it so dominates it was, the room it does dominate yeah. the room and i think there's a certain point where you sort of hope like i hope the crowd kind of turns on this guy uh, that often happens it's quite good when they do you know not you, not that you want another drunk guy to think it's his role to actually give the you know give my smack in the teeth or something right but, but it is quite good when the audience sort it out themselves and they often do yeah well, when when you did the uh, when you did the solo stuff um, again, try whistling this and one all, which I think was one nil in in everywhere else in the world. Right? Yeah, it came out a little later here, and I thought uh, by then I should add a couple of songs to it, and I called it one all. Yeah. One all, yeah. And also in America, we don't use the word nil really. Well, no, and anyway, everything in America has to be different. You know, like <laughs> right. you got American football, we got rugby. Right. You got. Um, baseball we've got cricket yeah you know like yeah 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 well i know you know because we're because we're basically like the hey we can do stuff too <laughs> yeah. you know like we for some reason we constantly have to feel like we have to prove a slightly something different name to some some americanization is necessary yeah it is a little bit necessary to feel it like is. this is our thing yeah that's this right is kind of our own thing hey, i'm hip to that that's do you cool. like it, it, so you said you like collaboration but 
is it is it important for you to sit down sometimes alone and really just kind of do stuff yourself? Well, I'm, all the songs, pretty much, unless I'm writing with my brother, or in this case now, recently with with Liam, my son. Um, I, I do. I start the process on my own, and it's a real just a dreaming, imagine, you know, drifting away, lot, often on quite banal things and then all of a sudden just by turning up every day you get a good idea that's all a really solitary thing and I'll make a demo or maybe a series of demos sometimes actually to get myself into what the atmosphere of the record might sound like um, and that keeps me going basically just keeps me moving forward do you feel impatient ever with the just because of the way that media can be delivered instantaneously to people now do you ever have to stop yourself if you just record something really fast. Go, oh, I was going to put this on the internet. Just do, do you feel like, oh, maybe I shouldn't do that, or maybe it, do you feel more pressure that it has to be very presentational before you put something out, or do you ever just think, oh, I'll just put this one little weird thing out? Well, I mean, I, I have had that um, that temptation on many occasions to just put something straight out there, and I have resisted so far because. Um, it, yeah, I mean, the chances are that most things you do like that is going to disappear without trace. And then you, you might have a moment's pleasure and, like, you know, your hundred um, responses um, <laughs> are going, yeah, we love this. And then, <laughs> and then so it's, you know, like, it's hard to get, it's hard to know how to get noticed out there. Um, I love the immediacy of that idea. I think I'm going to try something next year, which is a, a new thing for me. Um, which I won't even talk about because some other bastard will steal the idea. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I'll tell you what, though. If you kind of talk about it a little bit here, then you have proof that you said it first. If you don't say it, uh, that someone also else does to it. Me, yeah. Then if you don't say it and then someone else does it, you can't go, well, that was the thing I was talking about. People go, well, I didn't hear you say that. But if I do say it on your show, will you then stand up and, and publicly... Um, you know, take someone down for Neil, that. I am so Weird. much your fan. I will track that person down and Good. beat the living shit out of them, and I'm, I don't know how to fight. Uh, I will hire people to do it, Yeah, because that's the point I am in my life. Well, I'm still now faced with the predicament of whether I, I tell you about it or just hint at something. If you say it, and then later you regret it, I'll take it out. Ah, uh, and I'll never tell a soul. No, no I'm it's only I'm actually didn't even worry about this, but there's a couple of people I know who have been aware that there's a lot of pirates out there who steal ideas, you know. And it's a great trait for a for a contemporary anybody contemporary really. But you know what else? Yeah. No one else is you. The way that Neil Finn would do something is mm. not the way anyone else would do it. Well, I like the idea of constructing an event that is the making of a record, not not in a traditional um, sense, but creating an event and having that be completely live and people get get the whole thing. They get to be part of the whole thing, and they get the record. That's a spectacular idea. And um, I, I swear, even if it doesn't even matter who else would ever do that idea, it would never be the experience that you would create. Well, no, no, and the detail of that is, is possibly what sets it apart a little bit. Anyway, it was just a nice... I've got a bunch of songs at the moment, two or three records that are circling and ready to go, almost ready to go. Um, I don't know which one's going to uh, arrive first, but um, that is one very appealing idea for this particular bunch of songs, that it would be nice to be able to create an event around them and then... Um, have people be able to be part of that um, event? Are you? I'm not talking about a live album. No. Uh, do you ever get caught up in? Uh, how caught up do you get in the sort of the the presentation and the naming of an album and the art of an album and how people are gonna? Do you get caught up in all that stuff, or you to go? Well, no, I'm just I'm the so I write the songs. Someone else can worry about that stuff. No, you got to be a little bit involved because otherwise you end up with a really dorky photo of yourself on the <laughs> cover, or the, or, you, or some some idiot's written a press release that's got nothing to do with you, you know. And because uh, that's all the businessy stuff that I think when you're yeah. young you don't really have to, you don't really want to think about. But it's you've... always good to keep a heart. I mean, actually nowadays I think con I've always been concerned about that because you don't want. I mean, the traditional hypey record company PR release was an embarrassment, you know. And right. You had to write, I sort of would either write myself or get somebody I knew to write them that I knew was going to be as if you were speaking, um, representing you. Uh, nowadays, though, people are so much in control of their social media, I don't know how they get time to write or do anything because there's so much. It's such a responsibility. And, you know, there's obscure artists in New Zealand who've got more likes on their Facebook page than I have that I've never heard of, and they've just got this whole social media thing going. Sure. I'm in awe of it in a way. It's because it seems like there's a generational an evolutionary jump happening amongst, whether or not it's all uh, really positive, I, I can't say, but young people seem incredibly smart about presenting themselves in the world. And, they are, uh, but I know, do I do wonder how much value a lot of, so, you know, you see someone, it's like, oh my God, this, they have, you know, a million likes on this thing. Mm. They might, 
I, I still am not 100% sure how that necessarily translates. Like, if that person were to tour, I don't think it, you know, I don't think the math checks out that, like, you know, no. a million people would show up. No, it's a it's an empty statistic without some kind of context built around it. I think, yeah, that's yeah. true. Uh, and I and I don't actually spend a lot of time worrying about it. I've got the only social media I do is Twitter, and and the only reason I started doing it was because I was bored in a hotel, um, in a, sorry, an airport lounge with a delayed flight, and I started it for entertainment purposes for myself and hopefully for other people and I'd like to think that's mostly the reason I still do it. <laughs> There's a few times where I'll put a poster link for a show or something but mostly it's just if I have a you know late at night and I've had a couple of wines and I have a funny notion about something and that's to me the only reason to do it. I know that I could that people approach it in a far more clinical thing but it seems very boring to, to me. Yeah and also just too much it's just a lot of work. It's just a lot of work. It's too much yeah. responsibility and it saps so much creative energy. Yeah, I'm not on Facebook myself directly. I do obviously somebody does my Facebook, but hopefully no, they don't try and pretend they're me. <laughs> well, it's it's a really interesting idea that you only have so much energy in your brain for things. Yeah, and you know what was so great about the advent of social media, and you know, I guess really social media and it's in the form that we know now is about ten years old, ten or eleven years old. Mm. And it was such a great way for undiscovered people. Hey, I'll get my stuff. I'll take the middleman out. I won't have some company. Yeah say, okay, you're good enough to put out into the world. But I think what it has actually kind of done is sort of like what you were saying. It takes so much, it takes so much energy to then you're just, then you just end up marketing yeah. and not as much producing stuff. No, the, actually making stuff. Yeah. Making stuff in an old fashioned sense is still so valuable. I mean, and, and I think they, people do with their, you know, in their bedrooms and their computers now, it's like, it's far more of a, of a solo kind of endeavor. And it's amazing music being made. So I don't want to be like an old dude who goes, oh, things were better in my day. Um, you know, with the good old-fashioned corruption and... and <laughs> right, right. Uh, you know, when the record but, you know, business could really fuck an artist over, those were the yeah. good days. Come on, you just used to have to give cocaine to a pro- radio program and you were done. You know, that I mean, was it. it. Now you have to go and, you know, visit all these blogs. <laughs> to all these, um, now I have to deliver cocaine to a million people on yeah. Facebook. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of gatekeepers now, though. There is a lot of avenues, you know... I don't know whether it's still the way, but you used to you do an, a, a newspaper interview and that would just be sitting down with a journalist and uh, with a you know, tape recorder maybe. Now they've got a TV studio, you know, and you right. have to do a little session for them. And, yes. And uh, it, it does seem like there's a lot more avenues to explore. There's probably a few key things still. Obviously the TV shows, are, you know, the big TV shows are good, good mass exposure, but it did seem like there was – to do all of that stuff, that you could spend your entire time – um, promoting yourself and not have time to write or so what be was, a good human being. What was <laughs> spend time with your family, live yeah. in the world, eat uh, once in a while, yeah. take a shower and look at the sun. Uh, what was the in the early? I guess around two thousand five. What was the thing that made you say like, hey, maybe maybe we could do crowded, maybe we could do crowded house again, or maybe we could start making more stuff. Uh, well, I was I, I was hanging out with Nick again, um, and we obviously kept in touch, and we were good friends um, anyway, but. Just he was living in Ireland. I was living in New Zealand. Um, in the aftermath of losing Paul Hester, uh, in a very tragic way, um, we kind of were drawn together. And um, was that the same year? Did Paul? Yeah, pass it was away? later on. I was making a record at that time. I'd done it. I was touring with my brother. We were finishing off shows for the album "Everyone Is Here," um, and then I was making a solo record. Um, which is largely the record that came out as Crowded House record, Time on Earth. And Nick was playing bass on, you know, we, we just found some good comfort in each other's and uh, enjoyed making music again after the result of that. And I sort of, you know, quite honestly looking back, the reason that we, um, that I felt it was a good thing to do and a soulful thing to do was because there was this t- dreadful full stop on everything all of a sudden, you know, and this, and I thought that we had, Crowded House had put, I thought, a lot of joy in the world and Paul had as well. And there was just this terrible, big yawning sort of abyss that opened up after losing him. And I thought, well, no, well, let's let's hang out and make music together and try and and let's really spend some time trying to find a great drummer that can do some justice to the songs we did already and and uh, put some good history um, out there. Um, yeah. So that was the, the the prompt and the motivation. And to make a, we made a couple of I think really strong records. Um, and I feel good about it, and it's like a, now a, a thing that's sort of up on, like a, an old car up on blocks, you know, and it, it needs a little bit of attention every now and again as to turn the motor over. 
but we could get it out at any point. But I don't feel like now I, I'm again enjoying making music in a variety of different ways. So and it was the, so the reuniting was kind of therapeutic after. after yeah, it was, so. and I and I liked it, and I think it was soulful in the sense it wasn't. We weren't out to cash in on, you know. I mean, we had a lot of interests, and we did some great shows, and um, we toured the world. I, I don't really don't feel like we did it as a kind of well. Well, we better bring the old band back now because sure. you know we can we can make some money and that certainly wasn't the motivation for me and uh, or Nick. So yeah. Uh, and then Intriguer was also a great, uh, a really great album too. Uh, Elephants. Thank you. Elephants was a beautiful, beautiful song. That yeah. Every year I make a playlist. Yeah. That starts on my birthday and I name it after how whatever my age is. Right. And then just throughout the year I just sort of like I'll just throw songs that I like onto that playlist. Have you just for your own sake or do you does it turn up on Spotify? As no, well? no, 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 no. It's just oh, for okay. just for me. I've been doing right. it for almost like fifteen years. Oh, yeah, great. Just yeah. So I just have fifteen years and it just becomes this kind of musical diary. And there's yeah. just there's just it's you know you or Crowded House or it's like it's awesome. so great how the songs will come back around. Mm. again and hit you in a point in your life you're like oh my god yeah oh i forgot oh this song oh yeah that's right oh and now it's meaningful now well i i feel completely and utterly blessed that that is the way that songs work because um i you know when you write them and then they even come back for me as well like i'll i'll um go out and i'll i say i haven't played this song for 10 years and i'll play it on piano where it used to be on guitar and i'll suddenly go oh wow this is actually a a hot, completely fresh thing for me now. It, it kind of blows my mind, you know, like it's just connected from to the past. It has nostalgia, some nostalgia attached to it, but it also a living, breathing thing that... Yeah. And people people tell me about, you know, always about um, moments in their life where certain songs were valuable to them and in some ways, mysterious ways that I couldn't have predicted. And yeah, you just, just thank your lucky stars to be part of that process. What's your most surprising collaboration that you pulled off? Like someone that you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I got to play with that person. Um, well, I mean, at the time, I, there's a guy in Australia called Michael Lunig. Do you know him? He's I a, don't, he's a sorry, really don't. great cartoonist and um, kind of philosopher cartoonist. And he would be accessible via the internet. Very much loved in Australia. And I did a, um, a, sh a tour with him. Uh, and the Australian Chamber Orchestra, a guy called Richard Tonietti, who's got great, amazing um, small chamber orchestra and a bunch of a children's choir um, and a series of really odd, like a, 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 a electronic musician from Sydney who does really strange things, who had the whole mix going through his his fridge, you know, his electronic <laughs> fridge. Um, that was an absolutely amazing experience because it was, it, and that was ten years ago now, but it pulled me right out of. I'd never done anything like that remotely. Um, suddenly scoring or writing songs for a children's choir. Um, you know, that's the kind of stuff that I love particularly now more than anything. I enjoyed working with... Uh, I've got a great arranger in New Zealand called Victoria um, Brown, who's an amazing... Um, that We work really well together, and she does great string arrangements. So I'm really enjoying that process. Um, the broader palette is really um, fun for me at the moment. So, um, yeah, anything that drags you out of... You know the the broad the the narrow parameters of pop music is really good, I think. And you and for you, I would imagine creatively, you just need to keep it fresh to like to freshen up every so often. Yeah, you've just got to keep your brain. It's you know brain plasticity as it is. You know, like you learn a few new skills. So um, <laughs> it's important for anybody. I think if you're just repeating the same old uh, same old things, you just end up like Aussie. You know. Well, what <laughs> what is the what is the I thing? Should... No, it's fine. I know I know exactly what you mean, though. I know exactly what you mean. What it. What do you feel like after after all this time? When you look back, like, what you know? What did you learn? What do you learn about your music, or what do you learn about yourself, or what do you learn? You know, just for I'm asking because a lot of people are creative types who listen to the podcast, and I'm sure they're just starting out, or they're trying to figure out their thing, or find their voice. Mm. You know, if you were to tell a young Neil Finn, like, hey, psst, by the way, you know, do this, don't do this, don't worry about this, worry about this. Uh, well, I mean, just turning up is, you know, like, as simple as that sounds, turning up every day and, and working every day, if you can, is it's super important, I think. Um, because, not you know, most of the time nothing's going to happen, but um, you're going to be able to notice when good things happen, far more you're tuned in. And, and it's like that with anything. The more you do it, the better you get at it. It's just as simple as that. It's not, it's not, it's a mystery. The moment of inspiration is a mystery, but the means of getting there shouldn't necessarily have to be. Um, uh, you know, apart from that, God, I don't know, really. Well, I wouldn't good. do anything that much different. 
the, and the other collaboration, like doing Seven Worlds was the other thing that I would say that that's, I think putting yourself in a dif- dangerous states and difficult um, positions as a musician is really healthy as well. You can play to your comfort zone endlessly. And people that are, I think, spending too much time in their bedroom, that's what happens a lot these days. Sure. People are making records in there. I think get it, get it out in the light. Yeah. You know, play it for people. <laughs> um, when you circle around with your own ideas for too long, it just gets really um, claustrophobic in there. So, yeah, make sure you've got someone you can play your music to and, and play it for real as much as you can. So when, when does the Crowded House reissue come out? Uh, I think in November, um, okay. all of them. They might be available pretty soon. I'm actually not 100% sure that I know those out. dates real soon. And I think it'll be available in the U.S. Um, through a universal I know a packaging and all up um, uh, because they now own all that stuff. Is it, is it coming out as one big like box set or is it, or they're just all being reissued? It's not actually, I, I mean, there was talk of a, an actual box. I mean, really it comes sure. down to, it's just going to be a box. Right. That's the difference. The, all the records are available. They're all, every single one of our records is accompanied by, on CD is accompanied by an extra bonus CD of rarities, demos, um, notable performances from stage. Uh, it's a pretty tasty little package actually <laughs> we put a lot of effort into making sure everything earned its place um all those rarities i don't want to und- undo any of the mystery of what makes the record stand as they stand sure. but there is some quite interesting little um glimpses into the the, the the way that songs travel and and what happens to them along the way and where they come from my demos I th- i'm very fond of so i'm kind of happy people are hearing those they will all be. You could put a box in them, and we may even have one standing by that I'm not even aware of. <laughs> They're all going to be. It's going to be a little box in the shape of a house. Yeah. And all the CDs are going to be crowded. Well, I, I hope. I hope we have got that. Sort of got. I, now that I'm aware, I've got that. Got lost. We talked about that a while ago, and I got lost in the in the detail of what we were doing. I don't know. There might still be a box. There could be a box. You could make your own. I think if somebody makes a great box. I'll, I'm gonna put a really good package, a really good prize <laughs> together for you, and then fill that box with uh, with some really good with some really good yeah, stuff. Make make your own box. Send in a photo or a, you know, or something, and I I will make sure that you get tickets to the next years of shows. I I will do that myself. Really? Are you, are you playing in LA anytime soon? Are you doing any Largo shows this time? I am doing Largo show on Sunday and on Tuesday. When does this go to? Um, I th- when do you want to put it out? I think we were going to put it out closer to the reissue, sure. so that it was so that people that could great. hear it. And well, we will have done them, go. which is probably good because they sold out anyway. It turned out great. You're welcome to come. <laughs> I, I might add. I would love to. I would absolutely. We're love doing to. Sunday and Tuesday, so take your pick. Tuesday, yeah, Tuesday would be great because I, okay. I have to work Sunday. And, and, and you know, Flanny and I, Flanny and I email every once in a while, and because yeah. I, I just I miss. I just miss the community of Largo. Well, and me, I've been you know, so, I love it there too. I've been so, so busy, but um, I'm now. You had you agreed to play some songs, and I'm yeah. I'm in this very strange position that I never thought I'd be in, which is when you know how often do you think, oh, I'm sitting down with one of my musical heroes, and he's like, hey, I'll play whatever you want, and then I I go, well, shit. So I actually had to. I I tell you what, I made a I made a list of a bunch of my favorite okay. Neil Finn slash Crowded House songs, and if any. You know, Lullaby Requiem was pretty great. If yeah, you, I have got it. I mean, that would be... No big deal. I'll tell you what. I'm going to read you the list. If any of them jump out at you, I am totally fine with any of these, all right? I haven't played that one for a long time, so I might struggle with the lyrics. No worries. I have uh, Whispers and Moans, mm-hmm. Sister Madly, In the Lowlands, mm-hmm. Never Be the Same, Not the Girl You Think You Are, oh, yeah. so good, Pineapple Head, Love, Elephants, Driving Me Mad, Solo, Lola yep. Requiem, She Goes On, Woodface, Hole in the River, fucking amazing song. She Will Have Her Way, really, and then Sinner. Well, I mean, I can do some of them. Some of them, actually, the ones that are a little bit, would be a little bit tricky, but I could probably manage any of them, really. Um, of those ones you mentioned... Uh, hole, in the, hole in the River? I've never played it on a guitar, but I could. It oh, would, it see, would work. That's, that's a fun... Well, I'm, I'm happy to have a crack at anything, actually, to be honest. So that, I, Great. I'll, I'll see, yeah. Great. Yeah. All right, this is a special request for Chris, which I normally play on piano, but I'm going to play on guitar today because um, that's all I got. Yeah, so listener requires good imagination at a certain point in the song. I'll try and supply a few bare bones. Oh 
touched by a cold wind My father and I Sound of desperate breathing The fear inside us Gonna be, gonna be the cameraman. <laughs> I'm amazed that anybody's asking me because people don't ask that question anymore. They just do what they want to do. I like the way your fingers were actually in the foreground of the shot there. That was quite nice. No, it was a little. <laughs> Somewhere deep inside. Something's got a hold on you And it's pushing me aside See it stretch on forever I know I'm right For the first time in my life And that's why I tell you You'd better be home soon Stripping back the coats Of lies and deception Back to nothingness Like a week in the desert That's why I tell you, you'd better be home soon. So don't say no, don't say nothing's wrong. When you get back home. It would cause me pain If we were to end it 
that I could start again. You can depend on it. Be home soon. Yeah. There is freedom within. There is freedom without trying to catch the deluge in a paper cup. There's a battle ahead, many battles are lost, but you'll never see the end of the road while you're traveling with me. Hey now, hey now, don't dream it's over. Hey now, hey now, when the world in my car There's a hole in the roof My possessions are causing me suspicion but there's no proof And the paper today Tales of war and of waste But you turn right over to the TV page Hey now, hey now Don't dream it's over Steps to the door of your heart. Only shadows ahead, barely clear in the room. Get to know the feeling of liberation and release. Well, hey now, hey now, don't dream it's over. Hey now, hey now, when the world. Build a wall between us We know they won't win Did you hear that, Donald?
Enjoy your burrito.